Hello, everyone. I'm Ann Havmeyer, director of the Norfolk Library. And it is my pleasure to welcome John Bunker virtually to the library this evening. Although John lives in Stratham, New Hampshire, he has a close connection to Norfolk in that his sister-in-law, the late Pam Kinsey, lived in Norfolk and was a wonderful friend to many of us and to the library. She was a longtime member of the library's volunteer group, the Library Associates. And working as she did in a bookstore, she always made the most wonderful suggestions of books for us to order. We miss Pam a lot. So when John stopped by the library last summer to donate a few boxes of Pam's books, I was delighted to meet him and to find out that he had given many presentations on our national parks, in part to benefit the nonprofit organization Yellowstone Forever, located in Bozeman, Montana, and their efforts to help restore the native Yellowstone cutthroat trout population in Yellowstone Lake. John developed this presentation for an undergraduate class at the University of New Hampshire when he was associate dean at the UNH College of Health and Human Services. In fact, he has visited 25 national parks in the past two decades. So for anyone who is planning to visit our incredible national parks or simply wants to learn more about them, John is here to tell us about the lessons he has learned. Thank you, John, for your presentation this evening. Thank you, um, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us tonight, and, and in particular for the kind words for Pam. Uh, we all miss her uh, greatly. Um, I, I'm looking forward to this presentation this evening. As uh, Ann mentioned, I've done about 25 or 30 of these for different public libraries, and what I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit about the program. We're going to start off with a um, one of my favorite hikes in uh, Zion National Park out in uh, Utah. And uh, we're gonna do Angel's Landing. And then uh, Kelly is going to tee up the uh, 10 lessons learned to share with you. And then I will um, regale you with stories and images of uh, four national park visits that I've had. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. And then I'll talk a little bit about some great resources. So, um, as Ann mentioned, I live in Stratum, and I've been very fortunate to do a lot of travel around the world. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia, and so I got to spend a lot of time after they decided to have a revolution in the Serengeti National Park and Maasai Mari and some others, and I've spent a lot of time in Europe, in the Alps, and I can tell you that our national parks are a treasure uh, from around the world. So we're, we're very fortunate to have these parks uh, in our um, in the United States right now. So uh, Kelly, why don't we start off with um, uh, Angel's Landing. <clears throat> so if you Google 10 most dangerous hikes in the United States, uh, you almost always start off the top with uh, Angel's Landing. <clears throat> Thank you. 
thanks, Kelly. And while you're uh, getting my uh, lessons learned up, I can say a little bit about this hike. Uh, Zion National Park is one of five national parks and uh, it's located in Utah. So you have canyon lands, um, you have arches, you have uh, Zion and Bryce in Capitol Reef. And this is one of my favorite hikes when I get out there. It's a hike that is uh, fairly strenuous. And it's also a hike that I don't recommend for everybody. <clears throat> and when Kelly pulls up my presentation of lessons learned, it probably is the best one for respect your age, your environment, and your experience. Um, John, can you see it? I have it pulled up. That's perfect. Thank you okay. so much. So I, I, like to sh I like to show that hike because not everybody who goes to a national park is going to be ready, willing, and able to do that. And um, I advise, uh, I have a lot of clients over the years. I have individuals, groups, and families who put trips together. And uh, I put together this lessons learned for them. And I'd like to share them with you today. So... <clears throat> Number one uh, lesson learned, and this is particularly true today, is you have to plan ahead. Um, I have a, a friend who called the other day and said, I want to go to Glacier National Park. I called my three favorite lodges and they were all booked next year, except for two days. And uh, the same thing is true in Yellowstone National Park as well right now. So if you're planning to visit some of the 10 most popular parks and you're planning to do it during peak season, um, you're gonna find it very challenging to find uh, lodging out, out there right now. <clears throat> it's really important to uh, take about six months to a year to plan your trip, uh, looking at logistics. And um, it's very difficult to put a trip together today in less than, it, unless you're going off season. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's thinking about a, uh, something to do next year to uh, book tomorrow and, uh, think about what you wanna do and how you wanna get out there. Uh, my second lesson learned is spend as much time as you can about the history of the parks and information about where you're going to visit. Every single park has an exceptional website and I have it in my handout, nationalparkservicemps.gov. And in that, in that website, it gives you information about learning about the history of the park, any road conditions, any travel restrictions, and they have a, a, a good example of all the lodging and uh, uh, places to eat and different hikes. So I think that to really maximize your time in the park, do some homework, you really enjoy it. Number three is respect your ability, your age and environment. I see too many people in national parks doing really, really stupid things. Everything from driving off the boardwalk in Yellowstone to see how hot the thermal features are. I've seen people actually try and pet a bison. I've seen people get within five feet of an elk. Um, these are national parks. They're beautiful, they're wonderful, but they are extremely dangerous in different conditions, um, weather, terrain, animals, depending on where you are. So no matter what you do, think about your ability, your age, and your environment. I tend to be a hiker, so I think it's important that everybody to leave the trailhead with essentials, and it's a pretty standard list of the 10 things that you want. Number five is uh, read the rules and regulations. When you go into every park, they have a newsletter, and they outline what you need to do and what not to do. So if you're going to Glacier or the uh, the Grand Tetons or Yellowstone, you need to carry bear spray and um, you need to respect the animals, you know, 25 yards for bison and elk, 100 yards for, for bears and wolves. So um, a particular challenge out west is, um, you know, if you're at 7,000 feet and you don't wear sunscreen, you're going to have a very rude awakening. Uh, also, if you don't drink enough water, you're going to end up with a, a really hellacious headache. And so safety first is a real key for everybody when you get out there. Number six, um, buy your gear before you get out there. The prices are much higher. So 
you know, if you're looking for um, a, a good set of binoculars or hiking poles or boots or, you know, Gore-Tex uh, hiking gear, uh, buy, it, buy it close to home. Number seven, I highly recommend taking a class when you're out at the national parks. Almost all of the large national parks have a nonprofit arm, a 501c3 organization. In Yellowstone, it's Yellowstone Forever. When you go to Glacier, it's the Glacier Institute. In the Tetons, it's the T Teton Institute. And these programs are anywhere from a half a day to a full day to up to five days. And it's a great way to get to know the park. Uh, the instructors are excellent. And in some of my slides, I'll give you an example of those, um, of those classes. Um, <clears throat> Kelly mentioned earlier when we were talking that she would never visit another national park during the summertime. And um, what's happened in this country is we've, um, we're over loving our parks. A, a good example is in 2019, Yellowstone had 4.4 million visitors. And with COVID, it went down. But last um, July, they had over a million visitors and they set records for visitors in July, August, and September. I just got back from Yellowstone for 10 days. And even in October, it was relatively crowded. I was out there in May as well. So the real key is to go off season. And then the other key is get up early and stay light. I always recommend to clients and friends, you know, get up at the crack of dawn. It's the best way to see animals. There's very little traffic. Go back to your hotel or your motel or your campsite. Enjoy some leisurely time and then get back out at night. But if you're going out to the parks to see animals, uh, the best time to see them is clearly in the evening and in the morning. The other thing that I see clients do and friends and family is they try and do everything. I would encourage you to pace yourself and to prioritize one or two activities a day. And, it, you know, you're going to expect delays, but if you're going to try and do everything every day, you're not going to have a great time. And the last thing is uh, make sure you keep a journal. Um, <clears throat> it's really wonderful. I've been out to Yellowstone now almost 250 days, and I keep a, a record of the journal going back 20 years. And a, a group exercise that I do every night with friends and family and clients is we'll go, what was the lesson learned and what was the highlight? And I was looking at one of my old journals and I'll give you an example of a lesson learned. I took two of my good friends from graduate school and we went out to the Grand Canyon. And we got there at seven o'clock in the morning and um, we parked the car and went down a hike that was pretty, very rigorous. And uh, by the time we got to the bottom of where we headed, it was pretty warm. By the time we got to the top, it was snowing. And um, we looked at each other and asked the question, where did we park the car? And there are about uh, 4,000 parking spaces in, fourth, in four different parking lots in the Grand Canyon. And for the next hour and a half, three um, gentlemen with PhDs walked around and looked for a car that looked like just every other rental car from Salt Lake City covered in an inch of snow. So a lesson learned is remember where you parked your car. And there are many others as well. So those are some of my lessons learned. And when we get to Q&A, if you have any others that you'd like to share, I'd like to do that as well. So Kelly, what I'd like to do now is do the share screen and pull up my presentation. Yep, you've got it. We can see it. You just need to put it into presentation mode. Okay, so it's ready to go. It's ready. Go ahead. So um, we should be able to get that going. So today I'm going to take you on four adventures. We're going to go to Yellowstone, my favorite national park. We're going to go to Glacier. We're going to go to the Canyon Lands out in Utah. And we're going to go to the Badlands. So um, this, is a, um, this is not a picture of Yellowstone. This is a picture of, um, excuse me, this is a picture of the Grand Tetons. Um, I've been up as high as this saddle right here. And the Grand is, if any of you know, when you get off the plane in Jackson Hole, this is exactly what you see. And uh, 
I would highly recommend a trip to the West uh, in, in the winter time. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So Yellowstone is located in Northwest Wyoming. It's 2.2 million acres. It's the world's oldest national park established in uh, 1882. And there are basically a series of roads that form a figure eight. And um, there are three airports that you can fly into, Bozeman, which is my favorite. Uh, Bozeman is the home of Montana State University and the Museum of the Rockies. And it is a fantastic uh, museum, particularly if you like dinosaurs. You can also fly into Jackson and you can also fly into Cody. So that's where Yellowstone is. And the larger green area represents the Yellowstone ecosystem. So while Yellowstone has boundaries, the Yellowstone ecosystem really is a conglomeration of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. I've been out to Yellowstone twice in the winter time, and I will have to say it's probably my favorite time to go out. Um, the only road that's open is from um, Mammoth out to um, Cook City, and everything else is closed, and you have to use park transportation. So here's an example where they take off the wheels and put on treads, and uh, you can see our skis loaded up. And uh, you get a couple of visuals that you don't see everywhere, a bison waiting to make a telephone call, for example. And uh, Yellowstone has about 240 waterfalls. And in the wintertime, it really is quite stunning to see the water coming down out of the, um, the Cascades. Um, most of the bison will hang out on the plowed roads. This is a bombardier. There are seven of us in this. We're driving down from uh, Mammoth Hot Springs down to Old Faithful in this. And here's one of the treats when you're out in Yellowstone in the wintertime on your cross country skis. You can see the thermal features where the snow has been melted and the elk will be hanging out. So this is a trip that I put together for the University of New Hampshire alumni system a couple years ago. My lovely wife, Jennifer Kinsey, Pam's sister and a couple of alumni and faculty members. And um, we used the Yellowstone Forever group to put the trip together. They organized it, did all the transportation, all the lodging. We had a guide with us every day. And it was just a wonderful example of uh, the ability to see the park safely and learn uh, uh, a lot about the park as we went through. Uh, this was a snow snowshoe trip. So uh, these two sisters were, I think, 75 and 79, and they were real troopers and we had a great time. A uh, typical day would be, would go out and do some cross country skiing. There was a warming hut with a fire and some uh, hot chocolate. And this is what Yellowstone looks like in the winter time. You're at 7,000 feet. Uh, you've got a couple of feet, uh, peaks at 10,000 feet. And it's one of the most uh, stunning landscapes I've seen. I've, living in New Hampshire, I've done a lot of cross country skiing in the Whites and I've done some out in Colorado, but I think the, uh, the big sky of Wyoming and Montana, there's nothing quite like it. So this is a typical morning cross country ski trip. One of the real treats, of course, is the thermal features. So many of you probably know Yellowstone has half of the world's thermal features. So there are a few morals, mud pots, geysers, and hot springs. And these are hot springs and a few morals. And with the cold weather, the, uh, the light is really quite surreal. And this is one of my favorite shots. You probably recognize this. This is Old Faithful, and on any other, any other day at 10 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning, you'd be standing there with 3,000 of your closest friends. And I took this picture with myself and a cup of coffee and nobody at 8 o'clock in the morning. So one of the real joys of being in Yellowstone in the wintertime is no crowds. In spectacular country. So many people don't realize that Yellowstone has 
an area called the Grand Canyon. And there are two waterfalls. Uh, this is the lower falls at 318 feet. And the canyon um, drops about 1,200 feet and you can actually cross country ski all around the canyon. And during March and February, this will basically all freeze over. It's, it's quite a sight to be looking down and seeing this frozen. This is Yellowstone Lake. Uh, it's the highest lake in the country. Lots of wildlife, even in, uh, even in the wintertime. So you got Mr. Fox out there, uh, Mr. Coyote, excuse me, Mr. Fox. Uh, this guy was right around the corner when I was doing a hike one day. And this is what it's like when you look down into the, uh, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And if you're a downhill skier, uh, this is Lone Mountain, which is Big Sky. And I've had a chance to ski most of the West. And this is by far my favorite mountain. Uh, it's just, it's stunning. Uh, there's very little um, lodging there. So you, you can basically ski all day and uh, not see a terrible amount of people on the mountain. So this is what it's like in um, the wintertime as you're in the front seat of a bombardier driving out for your morning uh, ski trip or snowshoe. So that's Yellowstone in winter. And now I'd like to take you to summer and fall. Uh, one of the highlights for me is sharing Yellowstone with friends. And this is my youngest son, Will Bunker. And this is his uh, college graduation about eight years ago, uh, took his uh, two best friends and their dads out. We spent five days in the Tetons and five days in Yellowstone. Um, it was pretty chilly. It was in June, so you can see some of the thermal features still. And this is what it's like to stand just above the waterfalls of the Grand Canyon. There's about 83 million um, uh, gallons of water going over per second. And it's uh, quite an experience to stand there with the water getting down. Uh, this is a shot of my brother, uh, Paul, and a friend of ours on the Firehole River, and I'll talk more about uh, fly fishing in uh, Yellowstone in a minute. Um, one of my favorite places to stay in Yellowstone is a set of cabins that is owned and operated by Yellowstone Forever, and they allow you to stay there if you do private tours or other tours, and uh, it sits in the town of Gardner. And it is a spectacular setting because you overlook the Yellowstone River and uh, the park from here. Uh, this is what the uh, Grand Canyon of Yellowstone looks like in, uh, in the summertime. And uh, the, the, this is the lower falls at 318 feet. And the upper falls is about 118 feet just above this. This is the world's largest uh, hot spring. Uh, this is Grand Prismatic. And the last time I was there in May, um, there was a two hour wait just to get into the parking lot for Grand Prismatic. So, you know, unless you're there at six o'clock in the morning, you can expect to spend two hours in line uh, trying to get access to this. One of the fun things to do in the wintertime, there's nobody around and you can hike and snowshoe and cross country ski to the top of this and look down. Um, it's really quite a, a stunning sight to see this if you've never seen a, a hot spring. As I mentioned, half the world's thermal features are in Yellowstone. Lots of animals. So uh, when I grow up again in my next life, I want to be an otter. Uh, all they do is go fishing every day, play, sleep, and make whoopee. So I, I think that would make my life pretty good. You got your coyotes. Uh, this is a black wolf that was about 30 feet from me as we were in Slough Creek a couple years ago. And um, it's a lot easier to see wolves now with social media. I would guess of the 250 days I've been in Yellowstone, I've seen wolves on probably five to 10% 10, 10 of the time. Um, but with social media and all the tracking, it's, you're much more likely if you're willing to get up at four o'clock in the morning and go out with the wolf watchers. Uh, beautiful elk. And, uh, you know, you've got your grizzly bear, you've got your moose, you've got your pronghorn. 
And of course you have your bison. And uh, here's an example of uh, one of the 4,500 to 5,000 bison that are in the park. Um, I stay, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but for the last 15 years, I've been a volunteer in the fly fishing program and they had this double wide trailer that we would spend the night in with showers and bathrooms. And this guy decided to visit us. Um, as a matter of fact, 200 of his friends did the same thing and we couldn't get out of the building for about an hour and a half. This is my oldest son, Luke Bunker. And Luke is on the right. And I took him and another couple of guys out to Yellowstone to go fly fishing and they found this shed. And they picked it up and held it up. But one of the rules for Yellowstone and all the national parks is you can't take anything out of the park. So they immediately put it back where they found it. Beautiful wildflowers in Yellowstone, particularly in April and May. So these next set of slides are, um, were taken by a photographer from the Great Britain. And um, I took the Phillips Exeter Academy Biology Department out for a trip a few years ago, uh, turned them over to the Yellowstone Forever Naturalist. And I went off and did some fly fishing and there were about a hundred cars parked. So that for me means there was a bear jam. So I got out of the car and I found <clears throat> this guy with the best lens I've ever seen. And I gave him my business card and I said, would you please send me a couple of pictures? So here's a couple of pictures that are not mine but uh, they give you an idea of uh, the park. And here's why everybody was stopping. Um, this grizzly was about 75 yards from the road. He spent about two days munching on this uh, elk. And you can see the, the, uh, the claws, you can see the mouth and um, you just have a new respect for the environment when you're in uh, grizzly country. You always carry bear spray. You always go with three to five people. Um, you're always talking. I've been in the park uh, quite a bit. I've never had a close encounter with a grizzly or a black bear. I've had uh, five very serious encounters with bison. I'm much more scared and wary of bison than I am of bears in the park. So uh, in 1984, they discovered that lake trout were in Yellowstone Lake and a bunch of knuckleheads thought it would be great to have this fish in Yellowstone Lake. Unfortunately, what it did is it decimated the cutthroat population. Uh, those fish eat about 52 cutthroat a year. And uh, by 1990, 95% of the cutthroat population was decimated. And the cutthroat population is essential for the bears and particularly for osprey as well and eagles. So this next picture is my National Geographic moment. So I'm standing on the Firehole River by myself about nine o'clock in the morning. And there's this huge splash behind me. And I made the mistake of not having my bear spray that morning because I was only about a hundred yards from the road. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die. It's either a bear or a bison. But what it was, was an osprey came down and pulled out about an 18 inch rainbow trout and carried it off. And luckily there was a park ranger standing next to me <laughs> and he clipped this picture. <clears throat> so, the volunteer program helped the park service in the fisheries estimate how well the, cut, the, the cutthroat trout were coming back after some mitigation. So we would have a yellow bucket. We would go out and fish and we'd catch the fish and we put them in the yellow bucket. Sometimes we would ride horses up to Slough Creek in the Lamar Valley. We'd catch the fish. Our coordinator, Bill, would do some DNA samples. Uh, sometimes we would put in monitors and sometimes we would tag the fish. And uh, this is Trout Lake. This is a, a belly boat. <clears throat> and um, these are beautiful cutthroat trout that we catch and bring over and the coordinator will tag them. And we report back to the park service about our findings. 
Sometimes we fish small streams, really small streams, very small streams. This is what's called dabbing for brookies to see if there's anything in there. And I spend a lot of time fishing out in uh, Montana. Uh, Pam was also a fisher person. And here's yours truly on the Madison River with the fish of a lifetime. So I started out, this is 10 minutes into the fish. I started up, up to my waist. I'm now down to my knees and here we go. <clears throat> Oops, see if this goes, yep. So I'm with a guide and he's below me. And that's my best friend, Jim, from graduate school at Johns Hopkins. And you have to appreciate we're in the Madison River and we've got thousand foot peaks on each side of the river. I'm now about 15 minutes into this fish. This is my favorite guy, Nate Stavane from Trout on the Fly in Montana. If you're ever look, looking to go fly fishing in Montana, he's the person you want to spend time with. This is probably a 26 to 28 inch rainbow fish that I have on the line. I'm trying to walk on these rocks that are really slippery. You're trying to keep as much tension as you can on the fish. And after 20 minutes, I lost the fish, but it was still a thrill of a lifetime. So this is what the Lamar Valley looks like. This is referred to as the Serengeti of Yellowstone. It's in the Northeast section of the park. And here's what it's like the next day. So Yellowstone's at seven to 10,000 feet. I've been there every month. And every month you can find a place where it probably is gonna snow. I was just there two weeks ago and I woke up, I spent six days in 80 degree temperatures. And on Monday, the 10th or 11th of uh, October, I, uh, I had 10 inches of snow. So let's go to Glacier National Park. This is my good friend, Peter Lamb, standing behind uh, Virginia Falls in April. He's completely soaked, by the way. <clears throat> so Glacier is located in Northwest Montana. Uh, you fly into Kalispell. It's about a six hour drive from Bozeman. And directly across the border, you have Waterton National Park. And if you're gonna plan a trip to Glacier, there are no hotel rooms available in 2022 inside the park. So you'll have to stay in Whitefish or Kalispell. And I've traveled a lot in my life. I've been very fortunate to live in Africa and spend a lot of time in Europe and have stayed in some pretty interesting hotels. But my favorite hotel in the world is the Prince of Wales. It's in Waterton National Park. And uh, that's all I'm gonna say about it. It's one of the unique places I've stayed. This is an itinerary that I typically put together for clients. There's only one road through Glacier. It's called Going to the Sun Road. I'll show you some pictures of it. It's only cleared from about July 10th through October the 2nd. So it's limited time in the park. <clears throat> and they're also limiting uh, like um, Acadia National Park and other parks now. They're limiting access to this road. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite places to stay, and there still might be reservations, in Glacier is the Isaac Walton Inn. It's the place where all the old railroad workers would stay as they put the trains together. Uh, this is the highest pass in the country in Logan Pass. And if you want a really neat uh, lodging experience, there are three cabooses that they've restored with running water and uh, a, a mini kitchen and a great bed. And you can stay in these and listen to trains all night. Um, glacier's full of grizzlies, so you gotta, you gotta bring your bear spray. Um, this is the cabins at Lake McDonald. Um, there's a lodge there as well. Uh, I show this picture because one of the challenges that you're gonna have if you're thinking about going out west is fires. 
So this is an example of a glacier fire. My brother four years ago went out to Glacier and wanted to spend four weeks in Montana and ended up spending about a week because the smoke was so, uh, so daunting. So I think everybody on the call on the Zoom meeting is very familiar and fires now are part of the American West and they really do impact your ability to have a time in Rocky Mountain National Park, in, um, in Glacier, in Yellowstone, in the Grand Tetons. So this is going to the road. <clears throat> it's closed, as I said, from about oh, probably July 5th. I'm here in April and there's snow another two miles up. So here's a lesson learned. A couple years ago, a law enforcement officer was taking a ride on his mountain bike just around this corner in April, and he didn't have his bear spray, surprised the bear in the cub, and the bear killed him, mauled him to death. So even walking on this road, you would have to have bear spray. And um, it's just one of the unfortunate lessons learned. Uh, Trail of the Cedar Avalanche Lake is a beautiful hike uh, that is a very simple, easy hike that's right off of this, um, this opening. Glacier is uh, one of the more stunning parks. I've spent a lot of time in Norway and Finland and Sweden, and uh, they've got some beautiful fjords and glaciers, and uh, Glacier National Park is pretty special. Lots of flowers, lots of wildlife. Uh, this is a typical hike. Uh, this is my best friend, Bruce. <clears throat> um, you, you can see we both have our bear spray on our belt. Uh, this is one of the lodges. There are three lodges. This is East Glacier, Mini Glacier, and Lake McDonald. Even if you can't get a room here, it's worth going to and having a drink and dinner. Um, they're just beautiful structures and they're real treasures. Uh, this is uh, our hike up on uh, going to the Sun Road. Um, we couldn't go any further because just up here there was snow. Uh, this is about April the 4th, so you can get an idea of what the snow banks look like. Uh, the Old Man in the Mountain. And here's uh, St. Mary's Lake. Um, you'll notice that the lake has a glacial tint to it. Um, so it's kind of a green, blue, silver. And this is my favorite hotel. This is the Mini Glacier. And if you ever get there, uh, ask for room 142, because room 142 is right here. And you wake up and you look over to Grinnell so one of, the, one of the tragedies of uh, Glacier National Park is in this um, hotel, there are two corridors with pictures of uh, glaciers from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And um, back in the 20s, there were 150 glaciers. Uh, today, there are 25. And uh, most estimates now, by 2030, there will be no more glaciers in Glacier National Park. So um, there is such a thing as climate change. Uh, I show this picture because in a runoff time, it's a very dangerous situation. Um, leading causes of death in the park are accidents, uh, drownings and falls. and uh, you really have to respect the environment that you're in. Here's a good example of why you want to hire a guide. Um, this is uh, Rob. He's one of the instructors. And uh, he was very excited. There were eight of us. And he said, stop right here. He said, take a look at this. And here is a basically a grizzly post office. Uh, they urinate on it. They rub it. And they basically send messages. And he could... He, he was so excited to see this structure. He took off his hat and showed us five or six different bears. And it's another example, you'd be walking down a trail, but nobody would pay attention to it except the guide. And the Glacier Institute has the um, about 75 different programs a year. 
So let's go to the Canyonlands. It's one of the five national parks in Utah. <clears throat> I usually fly into Salt Lake City, um, or you can fly into Las Vegas. And Canyonlands is located over by Arches. And Canyonlands basically is divided into three areas, Island in the Sky, the Maze, and the Needles. I went on a bike trip to the maze. And if you Google 10 most dangerous hikes, the maze always comes up in the top five. Uh, it took us 26 miles of driving and another 20 miles of biking to get to this spot. Um, we set up our tents. Uh, Carl said, be careful. Last week we camped here and there were scorpions and rattlesnakes. So that's always reassuring when you're setting up camp in this territory. Um, this is our outfit for the day. And this is, we're standing um, basically in this spot where Tom took this image of uh, chocolate drops. And this is what chocolate drops is, looks like if you get down into the park. It's very big country. Um, if you saw the movie Nomad Land, um, a lot of uh, opportunities to volunteer in the parks. And I would encourage you, if you ever get a chance, to volunteer in uh, Canyon Lands or, or just to get out there and see it. It's just beautiful country and it's a very special place. So the Badlands is my last park for tonight. Uh, I have a good friend who's a vascular surgeon and his motto when he went into surgery was what could possibly go wrong. So that's the motto for Badlands for me. So the Badlands looks a lot like um, the Danakil Desert. I lived in Ethiopia for some time as a Peace Corps volunteer. And you really feel like you're on the moon. So if you did see the movie Nomad Land, you saw the lead character as a caretaker in going down here. So you're anywhere from, I'd say, 70 to 200 feet down into the canyon. And <clears throat> the problem is you can get down, but you can't get up often because this is very sensitive limestone. If you think you're gonna climb up, it's gonna break underneath you. And um, what goes down does not always come up in the, in the Badlands. So a lot of dangerous cliffs. Uh, you gotta pay attention to where you're walking. Uh, but the reward is these magnificent structures and every 10 minutes um, they change. So there are selected areas in the park where you can go down to the floor of the canyon. And um, you, these are the ladders that you take up and down. So you also have to deal with rattlesnakes. So here's an example of respect your age, your environment, and your experience. So I'm fairly experienced. I feel comfortable in this area. You'll notice that I am covered with a sun hat. I have sun gloves on. I have a, a buff on and um, I've got good hiking boots. So, you know, the lesson for everybody on this call is just be aware when you go to a national park of your ability, your age and your environment. So that concludes my presentation in terms of the parks. Um, here's the uh, concluding section. So. I'm sure that I would imagine that uh, Norfolk has a copy of this. Um, my wife, Jennifer, gave me a copy of The Atlantic for Christmas. And this is the May issue. It's the lead article. These are three members of the Blackfoot tribe. And the lead article is by David Truer. And his essay really focuses on an ethical question of they're really not our national parks. Uh, if you know the history of Yellowstone, the Shoshone, the Sheep Eaters, we basically, we did, we drove Native people off these parklands. And somehow they are now our national parks. And he asked the question, what should we do about that? And there's a quote in here that really stays with me. And the quote is, I never looked at national, I never looked at Yellowstone National Park as a crime scene. And it really has changed my view of our national parks. And I would encourage you to read this as well. I begin every day with this 
saying, climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their energy, freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. John Muir loved uh, Yellowstone. So I'd like to open it up for questions. And this is uh, the Bitterroot Absaroka Mountains. I'm at about 8,000 feet at um, Holly Mountain uh, Dude Ranch. And uh, that concludes my presentation. So, and, and Kelly, I'm glad to have folks unmute, or I'm also glad to have uh, you folks read uh, questions in the chat. Great, thank you so much, John. That was so wonderful um, to see all those great images and I don't know, I'm so terrified of all insects and all animals and all creatures that <laughs> I'm not sure I can, uh, you know, um, navigate around around that fear. Hopefully I can, rattlesnakes and, and bear, I mean, I'm very interested in bear spray. We do have bears here, they're not grizzlies, but what is You don't bear have to worry spray? about them. <clears throat> what, what kind, what, what is it? Uh, bear spray is basically, um, pepper spray mace to the 10th power. I see. And uh, everybody should carry what canister, everybody should know how to use it. And uh, yeah. So do you have to be a certain distance, a certain proximity to the bear to? It's about 30 feet. 30 feet. 30 feet. And a lot of bears will bluff charge. So um, you, know, you have to ask yourself, is this a bluff or not a bluff? That is the question. <clears throat> Yikes. Do we have any questions in the chat room? <clears throat> yeah, so one of the questions is, who is the fly fishing guide you recommend in Montana? So the trout fishing guide in Montana is Nate Stavane. And if you go to Trout on the Fly, Trout on the Fly. And I've been with Nate for 15 years. And... Um, I just spent six days with him out in Yellowstone and the Madison and the Missouri River. So he's by far my favorite guide in Montana. And if anybody would like a recommendation, feel free to give them my email and I'll be glad to give them more information. I just put the trout on the fly link in our chat for anyone who's interested. Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> and there is another question. What website would you recommend if I wanted to volunteer at one of the national parks? So what I would do is I would go to each one of the national parks website at the nps.gov and they have usually volunteer opportunities right there at the website. There's also the national park. Oh, that, that's an important piece. Thank you. So uh, a comment that I want to make that I should have made is the National Park Service is made up of 62 national parks and 400 national monuments. Some of our national monuments are as spectacular or more spectacular than our national parks. An example is Bears Ear in Grand Escalante in, U in Utah. And the Biden administration just reversed the Trump administration taking about 85% of those parks and giving it over to the mineral rights folks. <clears throat> so I would encourage people not to just think about our national parks, but to think about our national monuments as well as great places to visit. Uh, less crowded um, and, and some spectacular scenery in those national monuments. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Yeah, we have two more questions. The first one is how are emergencies dealt with within the national parks? So most of the national, <clears throat> when, you, when you come into the park, you receive a, um, a newsletter. And in that newsletter, they have all of the safety concerns. So they'll tell you, here's the safety concern. So if you're in Yellowstone, you know, you don't walk on the boardwalks, you respect animals, and they give you the names of all the clinics as well. So you know where the clinics are. The, the challenge that is when you're in Yellowstone, there's no cell phone coverage. So you can be out in a hike and you can be in big trouble. I highly recommend to people, you know, know your age, know your ability, and know your environment. And I always carry a, carry a first aid kit. I'm trained in wilderness medicine. 
And um, again, you know, you're going to a national park. It, it's not like you're going to you know, a local park where you can have your cell phone and it's going to work. So safety at the end of the day is up to you to manage your safety. And there are, you know, there are emergency services, but, you know, have no cell phone service and you break your leg, you break your leg or sprain your ankle. Goodness. Okay. Well, here's um, another question. What is the cost of staying in the lodges or do you have other suggestions or ideas of places to stay? So the lodges are, the, are clearly the most expensive because they're part of the national, they're usually by vendors who have contracts. And then in the gateway cities, in the gateway cities for Yellowstone would be West Yellowstone, Cody, and Gardner. And the accommodations in Gardner are everything from, oh, I've stated some really great Airbnbs and hotels or campsites. So I have clients that will do everything on the least budget as they can. So they'll camp, they'll bring all their camping stuff, they'll cook their own food. Uh, the next best way I found is to get an Airbnb in Gardner, Cody, um, and the hotels tend to be fairly expensive if you're, they're very expensive if you're in the park on the gateway, other way, in other words, the park, the, the cities that are the entryway to the park, it's much cheaper. <clears throat> and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but camping isn't always necessarily a bargain in the national parks either. I remember when Keith and I were, I, I think in Glacier, we were shocked that I, at, it might have been $50 a night. It just seemed like a lot of money for a campsite. Yeah, I, I was just in Yellowstone and I think the nightly, uh, the nightly fee at Madison Junction was $45. <clears throat> okay, so somebody else asked, um, are your tours open to the public? And if so, how can we learn more about them? So what I do is I have my own company <clears throat> and I basically charge $100 an hour and if folks are interested, what I do is save you 30 hours of internet time in terms of, you know, where do you want to go? How do you want to, what do you want to do? Do you want, what's your budget level? And so I basically help individuals, friends, families, groups. I've helped, you know, families put family reunions together, school groups, you know, the library wants to put together a trip to you know, wherever. So that, that's the service that I, I do not lead trips anymore. And the parks are very clear that you have to have a vendor license to do that as well. So what I do, Kelly, is basically answer the question, where do you want to go? When do you want to go? What do you want to do? What's your budget? I really love that because one of the things I least enjoy is the planning of the trip. And I'm notorious for just showing up and asking for people for recommendations once I get there, which can both be good and, but it can also, you know, like bite you in the butt. All right. So um, somebody did say that camping at national forests just outside the parks are much less expensive. John, I don't know if you found that to be the case. That is the case. National forests are much less expensive. Good, yeah. Great suggestion. And somebody um, also asked, what parks or natural site outside the U.S. would you highly recommend? Say that again. <clears throat> um, a park or natural site outside the U.S. would you highly recommend? So I would highly recommend. Yes, they wrote highly. So we <laughs> want your best here. Recommend getting on a plane and flying to Calgary and spending a month in Banff, Jasper, Yoho National Parks. I am so impressed with what they've done. Uh, we spent three weeks up there two years ago. If the Canadians would please open their borders, it's gonna be the first plane ride I'm gonna take out of the country. Um, it's just stunning country. And um, they're, they're, they manage their parks so much better than we do. Um, so that's, that's, that's my favorite place to go. And then- Can you repeat that, the name repeat it, please? Sure. So Banff, B-A-N-F-F, -F, right. Jasper National Park, and Yoho National Park. Coho? Yoho, Y-O-H-O. -O. Okay, thank you. John, yeah. when would you recommend going to those <clears throat> Canadian national parks? Because I would imagine 
going in the winter time might have a lot of logistical concerns. Is that still the best time? Uh, well, you know, the best time to do would be a shoulder. So, you know, the snow, if you're not a snow person, uh, it gets a little crowded, but you know, September, June, I think would be my two favorite times to go. And then my other place that I really like, um, in particularly for East Coast people, is uh, my wife Jennifer and I went over to um, Portugal and um, the Azores in last year. And it's only a, uh, about a, a four and a half hour flight from Boston. And uh, the, um, the National Park in um, Portugal is quite unique. It's not like our national park in any way. They've actually grandfathered fathered all these small villages in. Um, and then uh, uh, the folks over in um, the Azores don't have national parks, but they have great state parks. And uh, Jennifer and I really enjoyed hiking in both the Azores and, and particularly in Portugal, it was a real hoot. And it's the least expensive of all the EU countries as well. So John, we're just about at 6.30. Um, May I, just I kind of interject one quick thing? Sure. <laughs> I want to just get back to the indigenous um, peoples. <clears throat> you mentioned um, the article in the Atlantic, and I just wanted to let everyone know that I posted the link in the chat to that article um, if they want to access it. And I just have a, a quick question about indigenous place names in the national parks. I was struck by at the University of Maine um, in Orono, they have both a Wabanaki name and a name of each building. So it really sort of interjects the fact that this was uh, the, the home of, of the Wabanaki peoples. And right. are there indigenous uh, place names in the national parks that recognize that or? Yes, there are. And there's actually a movement to change though. So if you remember Mount McKinley is now Denali. Yes. And uh, you're seeing more and more across the country um, uh, what we should have been doing a long time ago. <laughs> you know, these are all white people's names. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not the names of the parks. When so that's that's my editorial. <clears throat> yeah, John. Any chance you have a best state parks presentation that we could bring you back to give? <laughs> <laughs> I found that state parks are not nearly as crowded, and they can be just as stunning. No, oh, I, I, I would say I would echo that as well. Um, there are some state parks out in Utah that are just magnificent, just magnificent, and. Um, no, I don't have that presentation. <laughs> um, so everyone, we are going to post this recording on uh, the Norfolk Library's YouTube channel. So please feel free to access it there and to share it with friends. And thank you, John, for allowing us to do that. Thank you. And, and, and again, thank you for the kind words from uh, of Pam. I'll share that with Jennifer. Oh, good. Please do. And thank you so much, John, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and thanks everyone for um, tuning in tonight. I guess I will end the recording now if everyone is okay with that and uh, say goodbye. Thanks, that was wonderful. Be Thank well. You.